Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for coming. Uh, indeed, the discussions have continued uh, through the, I think, achievement of CRASH in opening up the portals of this university to people to, all over the world who have um, responded to the, the lectures, sometimes with alarming shock and objection, uh, sometimes with moderate uh, approval. Uh, no one was entirely persuaded by my arguments, but then, uh, after all, that is what, uh, what dialogue should be about. So I, w I want to say that CRASH is uh, a, a success in a way that the university, not only this university, but all universities need to be to reach outside of the boundaries of these portals in order to make what we do matter to uh, many other people and to reach the people for whom these subjects matter a great deal. So I want to thank Simon and through him everybody who has been involved in creating uh, this extraordinary series and I look forward to, uh, uh, I'm the second after my friend Hugh Strawn to, to the 22nd and the 32nd, uh, such, uh, such lectures in the future. Uh, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Well, I want to finish uh, what is basically a, a, a three-part exploration of the theme, the interpretation uh, that memory is framed by language. And it is framed by uh, symbolic forms uh, that have, in some uh, cases, very material uh, limits uh, and conditions attached to them, uh, film being one of them. I've tried to suggest that not only does language frame memory uh, and memories of war, uh, but that visual languages enter into our understanding of war in subliminal ways. And the language we use to talk about war, I want to suggest, has sources that we may be only partially conscious of. Today's lecture focuses on the mediation of non-documentary commercial film in the formation and dissemination of popular representations of of war. And just to start off, why I, I, I did it this way, I had the good fortune in 1986 to be asked to help design a museum of the history of the First World War in Peron uh, on the Somme. It was in German headquarters of the Battle of the Somme. And in the course of designing that museum, I asked a group of, uh, of French veterans, ancien combattants, what did they want in the museum? Uh, they were still, all of them are gone now, but in 1986, 87, they were, there were quite a few left. Uh, and uh, I got a, a virtually unanimous response, which was, we want film. And I said, all right, what film do you want? And the answer was uh, Jean Renoir's The Grand Illusion. That's what they wanted, because that film said more about war than any of the documentary and, uh, shall we say, uh, more uh, established uh, narratives uh, related to the war that they all had gone through and that they all knew. Uh, film has a power to um, concentrate minds and to construct categories that are important and I think in some senses essential uh, in uh, uh, our understanding of how we think about war, and not only how we do, how we teach about it in this university and in other universities too. My primary aim today uh, in the time available, and it's going to be uh, difficult to get the, the clips in as well as the interpretation, I'll do my best. Uh, is to show that imagining war in film has a history. And it is parallel to, but not identical to, that of waging war. Uh, cinematic art reflect, reflects and refracts changes in the material conditions and forms of warfare, and thereby contributes to the evolution of armed conflict by framing the way we understand what war is. And in this lecture, I think what we need to do more than I was able to do in the previous two, although it was probably important to do it anyway, is attend to the marketplace. The portrayal of military conflict in film is and was always a mainstay of the industry. Box office considerations are never absent in the framing and gestation of commercial film and the perennial popularity of films about combat, terrestrial or extraterrestrial, requires us to take measure of their power to represent men uh, at war. And it was, I think, in some sense, the starting point for this interpretation is to recognize the accident, the coincidence, that the film industry came of age as a centerpiece of mass entertainment at precisely the moment industrialized war arrived in 1914. I want to suggest 
that we need to examine representations of war, therefore, uh, from a perspective that deals with the silent period of the film industry with perhaps more attention uh, than it has been given in the past, because that's where the first part of the history of the cinematic construction and reconstruction uh, of war started. I therefore suggest that we adopt roughly three periods in the cinematic history of war. The first is the silent epoch, and we have to see it in its own terms, from about 1900 to 1930. And I extend this epoch beyond <coughs> the year 1926, when sound was initially introduced, because the majority of directors who made films after 1926 learned their art in silent film, and in fact imported silence into the talkies. If you uh, don't believe it, I suggest you take a look at one of the famous scenes in Fritz Lang's classic film M of 1931, in which a child murderer, played famously, as many of you will know, by Peter Laurie, faces a kangaroo court made up of hundreds of Berlin criminals. The faces of those criminals are scanned in a 52-second tra tracking shot that seems to last for hours. And the reason is, it's entirely without sound. Silence didn't disappear with the talkies. It entered into, the, uh, entered into and inflected the medium in a host of ways, even years after the introduction of sound. I think we frequently lose sight of the advantages to be had from silence. Suggestion is much more hypnotic than instruction. I return again, without repeating it, to Alastair Cook's bon mot I cited last uh, lecture about radio having much better pictures than television. And silent film, I believe, delivers better sound by drawing on viewers, viewers' pulse and heartbeat and internal voices. It is best to treat silent film not as a precursor of the talkies, but as a powerful art form in its own right, one whose technological disadvantage was its artistic strength. Silence framed war in ways that the talkies never could. The second phase takes place in the lead up to World War II and its aftermath from 1933 to 1970. I include pre-1939 films because the fear of the return of total war is evident in late 1930s cinema. War was both unthinkable and just around the corner. Images of war in the 1930s were seen by audience, audiences that included millions of veterans, many of whom would take up arms again in Manchuria, in Ethiopia, next in Spain, finally throughout Europe. European filmmakers who later fled the continent, such as Jean Renoir, did some of their greatest work in the later 30s, as some of us saw yesterday in a screening of The Grand Illusion. And I'll show you just a little clip of that uh, in a few minutes. This period also saw the production of some of the few pacifist classics in the history of the medium. The film industry is, by and large, not pacifist. There are exceptions, but that is not its voice. I have somewhat chosen arbitrarily 1970 as the end of the second phase of the cinematic history of war, but I base my decision on two interlaced developments. First, the Holocaust assumed a central place in the history of World War II and increasingly became a subject of powerful cinematic treatment in and of itself. That did not happen before the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. When I first studied history in this university in the 1960s, the Holocaust was not studied as part of the narrative history of the Second World War. It now is impossible to study the Second World War without reflecting on the place of the Holocaust uh, within it. This is a fundamental change. In addition, secondly, aside from that development, the Vietnam moment had a profound effect on film both repeating many of the heroic stereotypes of the World War II era initially, and to agree afterwards, subverting them. Films of Vietnam drew on World War II tropes, but went beyond them. Defeat mattered, yet so did dissent and dissatisfaction, muting the unflinchingly patriotic posture of early Vietnam films, such as The Green Beret of 1968 uh, with John Wayne, and producing in the next, the third period of war films, much darker and much more ambiguous treatments of the conflict. For instance, The Deer Hunter of 1978, Apocalypse Now 1979, and Full Metal Jacket 1987. For these reasons, it makes sense to separate war films in the silent period, in the period 1935 or so to 1970, 
uh, and those that came after 1970. That is the chronology I want to adopt in a, a rough and ready fashion. Now, the third phase of representation of war in film covers the period from the 1970s to our own times, when changes in the face of war itself inflect the face of war in film. My colleague Charlie Mayer has described what he terms the end of the age of territorial, ter territoriality at around 1960, an insight which forces us to see war over the last 40 years or so, not solely or primarily in national terms, but in subnational and transnational terms as well. War is not uh, and no longer primarily a classic military encounter between nation states and armies, but rather a constellation of conflicts, a messy and chaotic array of violent clashes between national troops, say British forces, American forces in Iraq or Afghanistan, and a wide variety of insurrectionary groups, not nations. Since the 1970s, war has often meant dirty wars waged by military elites against their own people, including in Central America, South America, Africa, and the Middle East. Not surprisingly, film has followed the tides of war into these destinations too. Some people call these wars later, post-1970 wars, asymmetrical wars. There's a big debate about that, but let's just use it as a term of art to mean that the two sides uh, fundamentally represent different political groups, some of them national, some of them not. So I'll say that asymmetrical war means civilian casualties on a scale and as a proportion of all losses greater than ever before. This distinction matters in the history of film because the shadow of the Holocaust is also cast on the victims of wars remote from those of Nazi-occupied Europe. I gave a draft of this uh, lecture in uh, uh, a year or two ago in which uh, a number of serving soldiers told me about the way in which now the Holocaust is studied in military academies as a form of asymmetric war. It came to me as a surprise, uh, but it's one worth thinking about. After all, what could possibly be more asymmetrical uh, than the Nazi military machine and, uh, and the civilian, Jewish civilian population of Europe. Of course, war as horror is not new, but the horror is no longer limited to the battlefields. It is present in cities, in the countryside, indeed everywhere. And one reason the Holocaust has become metonymical, standing for victims of war and violence elsewhere, is that everyone of Jewish origin at that time could have been killed with impunity. All they had was what Giorgio Agamben called bare life. Wars of extermination are wars without limits. They go beyond Clausewitz. They're not political. They're existential. And for that reason, among others, the war against the Jews was a transformational event with substantial uh, power of, of, as it were, standing symbolically uh, for later events. Now I come to the central argument of this lecture, and I hope to convince you of this today. But going on previous uh, questions, I think probably that's unlikely. Nonetheless. I want to suggest that this chronology, the backbone of this le lecture, needs uh, uh, an organizing idea, an organizing principle to make it work analytically as history. I want to suggest in each of these three phases of war film history, filmmakers have operated in one or two registers, or in one of two registers, or in combinations of two registers. And those registers I want to tell you about. One I call spectacle, and the other I call indirection. Now, film has always flourished in the atmosphere of the spectacular drama of war. But the power to convey the spectacle <clears throat> was limited in the first phase by the absence of sound. And in the third phase, after 1970 or so, by the absence of moral transparency between good and evil. World War II was the cinematic good war par excellence in that its power to simplify and dramatize latched onto a cause that was clearly intelligible in precisely those terms, the war of good against evil. In the evolution of that moral calculus, the Holocaust became more and more important as time went on. Here, the cinematic tools of indirection were necessary because the problem of representing the Holocaust defies uh, direct or simple solutions. Now, the third post-1970 generation of war films did not leave World War II behind, but instead oscillated between spectacle and indirection, between morally simplifying war and recognizing and presenting unsanitized, unsanitized glimpses of its horrors and moral predicaments. These films are one important source of the moral ambiguity with which the public has come to view war in the last few decades. As war has changed, it has been increasingly difficult to construct moral certainties about its meaning. 
Yet most films that show the ugliness of war in recent years stopped short of pacifism. They suggest not that war is always immoral, but rather that it is impossible to control and leaves men and women broken in its wake, whatever its outcome. A strong thought to leave when we consider the war in Afghanistan today. If these films have anything positive to say, it is to visualize the camaraderie, the courage, the sacrifice of war, affirming its power to bring out not only the worst, but also, at times, the best of, in ordinary people. Over the course of a century, war films have developed from studies of conflict to studies of combatants, their loves, their hatreds, their inner lives. Within this chronological framework, I note what may be termed, if I can get away with it, a pendulum theory in the choices directors of war films make. In the silent period, early filmmakers' forays were perforce not realistic. They had to be indirect, elusive, suggestive, performative because they had no sound. They had, and they didn't have the tricks of the spectacular that were to come. The texture and the roar of war, the sound of war, the sound of battle, artillery, air power, were not reproducible. The film's technological weakness, in my view, was its strength. Films of this kind gestured towards images of battle rather than pretending to show war as it really was. No one could, and I will assert more generally uh, and with greater risk, no one can show what war is really like. In the second generation of war films, the Second World War generation, for lack of a better phrase, the quest for cinematic realism came home, dominated to the great profit of the industry. Over and over, audiences saw combat, sacrifice, killing, and were led by filmmakers to believe they were there on Guadalcanal, in Iwo Jima, on Bataan, and elsewhere. Technical effects, massive injections of cash, produced this mighty canvas of war. But it is my view that however hard they tried, filmmakers could as little show the face of war realistically as they could show the dark side of the moon. In the World War II period, the pendulum swung way too far towards what was taken to be verisimilitude. The urge to show the real face of war is still apparent, but it exists along another powerful impulse, one that moves away from realism and towards suggestions of the unrepresentability of war in film. And in part, the emergence of this new element reflects the literariness of cinematic culture. War literature, from Graves' Goodbye to All That, Hemingway's Farewell to Arms, Eric Maria Remarque's All Quiet to Joseph Heller's Catch-22, all have made the madness of war part of our cultural landscape. The literary witnessing of the victims of the Holocaust has brought that madness into an even more haunting register that is increasingly at the heart of World War II narratives. But the change in representations of war is also a consequence of the change in war itself, its civilianization its transformation into the asymmetrical struggles which made the Cold War and its proxy wars so bloody. Wars between men in uniform and ordinary people, brutalized, mutilated, killed by the millions since the 1960s. The Cold War was anything but a long peace. The violence that it spawned was global. In this period of new forms of war films, of warfare. War films introduced us to different kinds of landscapes of violence, doing so in new and indirect ways. There is very little in the pre-1970 period to match the hallucinatory effects of the Israeli film Waltz with Bashir of 2008, a cartoon exploration of shell shock. Innovative approaches have the power to move beyond realism to explore the face of war at a tangent, as Kafavi says, we have to see the world at an angle, indirectly and with great power. And that face that the film industry shows increasingly since the 1970s is a soldier's face, not the face of war. In a nutshell, this is my argument. I believe that there is a shape to the history of war films, and secondly, that there is a set of choices, too, which we can see in all three periods. Those choices can be summarized roughly in this way. There's one school of filmmaking predominant in the years 1940 to 70, but visible today, which I turn that of war cinema realism. War cinema realism is that style of filmmaking which, through sound, scenery, and special effects, 
enables a viewer to leave behind the knowledge that violence and destruction is staged and to accept while watching it that the film is portraying war as it actually is. That is war cinema realism. In contrast, I'd like you to consider an alternative. There was and is an alternative school which I term war cinema indirection, evident before 1930 and more so after 1970 in our own times. It is that style of filmmaking which never lets the viewer leave behind the knowledge that the violence and destruction on screen are staged and never lets the viewer accept the illusion while watching it that the film is portraying war as it actually is. There were films of the Second World War which adopted an indirect style. Both before and after 1970, we can see the same thing. But by and large, the bulk of films made about the Second World War were realistic in the terms uh, I'm using today, and very frequently spectacular. From roughly 1970 on, the spectacle of war became less important in cinematography than the pathos of victimhood. Now let me see if I can persuade you of these perhaps too sharp or too bold distinctions in the time remaining today. That is the argument I want to advance and I want to leave with you today. First, silent film. I wish I had several hours to talk about silent film. I can't. <laughs> I can start with uh, D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, which wandered through the Civil War and Reconstruction with a romantic brush, memorably presenting heroism and battle, the assassination of President Lincoln and the chivalry of the Ku Klux Klan, chivalry in inverted commas. From that time on, silent filmmakers turned to the 1914-18 conflict, which formed the perfect setting for adventure stories, melodramas, love stories, and the like. But aside from very good box office entertainment, cinema contributed to popular narratives of the war by locating it with identifiably and mundane themes, thereby humanizing it. By suggesting the monumental scale of, of the conflict in a way prose could rarely do, cinema mythologized the war as a vast earthquake against the backdrop of which the petty conflicts and hopes of ordinary mortals were played out. The balance between what I call the cinema of indirection and the cinema of spectacle differed in each period of the history of war film. In the silent period, the realistic genre was perforce indirect because sound was absent, and silence was either preserved or replaced by impromptu or arranged piano or organ music, sometimes um, orchestrated and, some, as it were, prepared specifically by the filmmaker like Abel Gans, and sometimes not. Audiences, in my view, brought their own sound effects with them, and thereby were drawn into the story in even more compelling ways. Uh, the new, the film that won the Oscar this year for best, uh, best film, The Artist, makes exactly that point. Consider the contrast after 1926, when a score inscribed on a soundtrack told us commandingly, and still does, how we should feel how we should react. With sound came emotional dirigisme, a kind of authorial instruction telling us to feel suspense at one moment, relief later, and give a good sigh at the moment of resolution at the end. In 1916, the British government produced a film entitled The Battle of the Somme, which was distributed and shown while soldiers were still engaged in the staggering six-month operation. It's a perfect instance of the revolutionary effects of the First World War on cinema. Maybe two million people saw it in six weeks, the equivalent in today's Britain of six million people going to the same film at roughly the same time. I don't think that's ever happened. At the center of the film was an entirely false reconstruction of what it meant to go over the top. A line of soldiers in a trench crawled up to its lip, then stand and proceed through smoke and fire to engage the enemy. One man is hit, slides down the trench. The point I'm making is this is, this is uh, propaganda. But the point is, at that moment, all of the, sound, uh, the music that was used throughout the rest of the film was told to stop. Basically, all of the two million people who saw it saw going over the top with silence. That scene was instructed to be entirely silent without any musical accompaniment. And that silence had a staggering effect on the audience, many of whom had relatives serving in the war at that very moment and in the Battle of the Somme that was going on while the film was being shown. Women fainted, others cried out and had to be escorted from the cinema. Silence provided the visceral punch. And I think that's something that we, we lose sight of uh, in uh, our uh, entirely uh, sound-driven uh, cinematic world. <clears throat> 
Some films framed audience reactions in ways that tended to reduce their own affective choices to the ones the cineast or the composer provided. Silent films were more open-ended emotionally and hence potentially more powerful. Yet whatever the sound or silence accompanying the scene, those screen images carried a kind of authenticity, a surface realism with them. They appeared to be about real people, a real man hit on the lip of the trench who could have been the husband, the brother, or the son of someone in the audience. And in many ways, what we can see here, of course, is that there is, whether it's silent or not, the power of film to lie about war was revealed at its inception. I think films lie about war all the time. Uh, and with sound, they lie about it uh, quite noisily. The introduction of sound effects enable viewers to believe that they could actually imagine war. What is thinkable is what is doable. And one ramification of the introduction of the talkies was that war films helped domesticate a set of violent events that, at their core, resist representation. To be sure, all films misrepresent war, but talkies do so with gusto and with powerful effects. Now, part of the reason for the unrepresentability of war in all film is its chaotic character. Battle has no vanishing point, no center of gravity, and the rubble of destruction accompanying industrialized warfare in 2012, just as in 1916, makes it difficult to see what is happening and why. Films came out of the theater. They have a proscenium arch, as we'll see in a moment when I show you a few clips, which makes it, in some respects, uh, inevitable that they frame action and draw eyes to some central point of action. Yet the oddness of war, the weird, uncanny sights it presents to soldiers are frequently beyond even special effects because the film has to organize space around a particular perspective. Now, if the physical landscape of battle is almost always trivialized or reduced to mundane proportions, the emotional landscape of battle also eludes cinematic portrayal many times. I'll show you a, a, a perhaps exaggerated example of that in a moment. We cannot capture the smell of cordite or decaying bodies or the stench of the detritus war brings in its wake. Fear can be suggested but never tasted in film. And without that dimension, cinematic representations of war always remain stylized or worse. Thus. Both the material and the affective framing of war and film tend to reduce it to formulae or cliches. Exceptions there are, but they prove the rule. Silence had another major advantage in the early interwar years. Silent film, which can be defined as a set of cinematic non-speech acts, framed the mourning process in ways rarely, if ever, matched by talkies. Music and banal dialogue frequently turned filmic treatments of this theme into kitsch and worse. By saying less, and leaving viewers to create the words and voices in their own minds, silent film had the power to portray the predicament of men and women alive in the aftermath of wars that took life not by the score, but by the millions. After all, why did the two minute silence work so well? Spiritualism had wide appeal in both Europe and America, both before and after the Great War, and it gave mournful character to many war films. When viewers reach the end of Lewis Milestone's All Quiet on the Western Front, they encounter the faces of the dead looking back at them at the end of the film before they marched off into eternity. This was, in a sense, in many respects, All Quiet, a very American film spoken deliberately with American accents and intentionally without inflection to make it every man's film, not a film which had the you know, stock uh, German accents uh, that most uh, contemporary films have. In the 1930s, a number of talking films presented the dread of war to a public more and more concerned with the menace of the new one. And here we are on the boundary of the second phase. Frank Borzage's 1932 film, A Farewell to Arms, was downbeat, as was Sidney Frankel's, Franklin's The Dark Angel of 1935. More elegiac and marked by a deep sense of the futility of war was Jean Renoir's masterpiece, The Grand Illusion of 1937. It's very interesting to compare Jean Renoir's uh, work with Eisenstein's, because here we have two uh, very parallel statements, one which is as spectacular as possible, and the other which is as indirect as possible. And the contrast between the two was right on the edge of the Second World War. Sympathetic to German soldiers, filled with the fierce and defiant patriotism of French prisoners of war, Renoir's film humanized not war, but the men trapped in it. I'm not alone in considering it in a class of its own as a war film. It said so much about war without showing a single battle scene. That is indirection as cinematic genius. 
Now, it is, of course, arbitrary to choose to bracket films about World War II in the period from 1940 to 70 and to claim that most of them adopted a realist's pose in presenting war to cinematic audiences. There, there are many, many exceptions. World War II films are, have been produced long after 1970 and still are. And I'll return to this point in a moment. In addition, there were non-realistic, indirect, and unusual war films produced before 1970. And I'm going to cite one or two of them in a moment. One of them is the Japanese film masterpiece, uh, The Burmese Harp, first released in 1956 in black and white and released in color in 1985. Another in 1952 that I'll show you in a minute, Forbidden Games, Les Jeux Interdits, of René Clément of 1952 directs our attention away from the battlefield and to the way two children deal with war and death. How do you bury parents who've been killed in war is the question that is asked in that extraordinary film. In Konishikawa's tale, it uh, shows a Japanese soldier who at the end of war is sent by his allied captors to persuade his comrades not to fight on after the armistice. He fails, nearly killed. In his effort to rejoin his comrades, he traverses old sites of combat and is horrified by the hundreds, thousands of unburied Japanese corpses he sees. He decides to put on the robes of a Buddhist monk and not to go home, to stay, to tend the graves of his fellow uh, soldiers. His lonely vigil transforms the landscape of war into an lands eternal landscape of mourning. There are many other films that I could uh, talk about, but I think the important point uh, to bear in mind uh, here is that however nuanced the positive view of World War II was as a good war, most filmmakers aimed at a kind of verisimilitude that made audiences believe they could actually know what it had really been like. The most spectacular incidence of this one, for what I call cinematic realism, is The Longest Day, 1962. I tried to get a clip for it from it, I couldn't get, it was actually too long. The Longest Day was too long to use. Uh, directed by Ken Anakin and Andrew Martin. Filming in black and white to highlight the film's authenticity, producer Daryl Zanuck managed to acquire substantial support in military hardware from Britain and France as well as from the American Army. Cameo performances by a vast array of stars helped make this film the biggest box office success before Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List, a classic of the third generation of war films. Similarly admiring of the swagger of military masculinity in the American way of waging war was George C. Scott's portrayal of Patton in Franklin Schaffner's eponymous film of 1970. Bringing viewers onto the battlefield meant bringing them into the minds of the men who imposed their will on the enemy, and nobody tried to do that with more panache and maybe insanity than Patton. The presentation of the home front was another matter entirely. And in William Wyler's The Best Year of Our Lives, the troubled return of veterans emerges without much sugar coating. This is not a one-dimensional matter, even though I do think the distinction between indirection and the spectacular was there. What I term direct or realistic approaches to presenting war in film has plenty of room for nuance and contradiction. By no means were all World War II films formulaic presentations of this kind. I wanted to present one bad film. It seemed to me that uh, we can see the force of this in a particular Australian film called Attack Force 7. How do I make that big? Mel Gibson for you. Every cliche possible in presenting war without any uh, content. Sadistic and racial stereotypes. Watch this, the way it's sold. All right. Attack Force by Mel Gibson, I think, is one of the worst films ever made. And the claim, the claim I want to, to make uh, about it, which I, th I think is, is actually of, of some importance for unadulterated mediocrity, it's hard to beat. Uh, how many cliches can you fit on the head of a pen? 
uh, I ask you to count them. And this film actually sold well in Australia. I'm going to suggest something about mass markets having their own uh, particular uh, national appeal. But when we want to, to turn to examples of what indirection might look like, we have to talk about uh, the Burmese harp. But I want to do that in a very unusual term. The Burmese harp, I already mentioned, is one of the great Japanese films of the century. Uh, but it is marketed. And I want to show you a trailer to this film, which will show you the brilliance of the film, and then what happens to it when the marketers get hold of it. This is, as it were, the transformation of one of the great indirect films, or the films of indirection, into something that they believe could be sold as a film of spectacle. They're both in one trailer, which shows what a director wanted to do and what the marketers, what the people selling films, think that war should be. Namely, spectacle. It should be spectacular, and who better than the 1812 overture, uh, the author of the 1812 overture to do it. Now, the, the uh, second example that I want to give is, is uh, entirely different. Uh, this one is a story of two children, one of whom is a farmer's child and the other of whom is a Parisian child, and sh her parents are killed on the road out of uh, Paris along with her little dog. 
And the two of them work out that there must be a way to bury people. And the way to do it is by learning how to create a cemetery for animals. So they create this astonishing place where they can take pity on all of the creatures of the earth uh, before being able to bury the dead. And in order to do it, uh, they steal crosses from the local church and graveyards and get into almighty trouble. Uh, hence, paradise is lost again. Have a look at just a few minutes of a trailer of Les Jeux Interdits. I want you to know that the actors are four and seven, and Brigitte Fossi, who plays the little girl, never played a better role than this. Could you make it bigger, please? The man that crosses back, and the little boy destroys the cemetery, but keeps the little girl's <coughs> necklace uh, for an owl to keep for a thousand years. No happy ending. She goes off to an orphanage uh, where she is lost in the multitude of lost souls in uh, 1940 France. Now, I wish I had time to show you the third uh, claim uh, for the film of indirection as uh, the, the, the better choice, uh, and that is The Grand Illusion by Jean Renoir. We did have a screening uh, yesterday of it, and there's one, one scene between uh, two career officers who talk about whatever the end of the war, whatever it will be, will be the end of the, the aristocracy, the professional soldiers, and the gentlemen the Gentleman's War. Uh, I urge you all to see it. I'm afraid we don't have time uh, to uh, go through it as I would loving, lovingly wish to do. Now, I want to say that in, in many respects, what we have to appreciate is that indirection was not an invention, therefore, in the post-1970 period, but that it carried different messages about war and has done so ever since. After 1970 or so, filmic representations of war changed in important ways. The lid came off the story of collaboration and the Holocaust, both on screen and in wider discussions of the war. The effect of Marcel Ophus' 1969 film Le Chagrin et la Pitié, The Sorrow and the Pity, was palpable. The narrative of collaboration and resistance turned one of black and white to many, many shades of gray. The rewriting of World War II narratives to include the Holocaust in a central role coincided with the American defeat in Vietnam. It's this combination which I think was decisive in opening a new phase in the history of war films. The focus shifted from the war the soldiers waged to the victims of violence in the midst of a new kind of warfare. The new form of war ushered in a renewed and deepened concentration on the psychological and moral effects of war on the combatants themselves. In this way, the meaning of what is now termed asymmetric war was inflected by its growing linkage to the Holocaust, the only war 
the Nazis won. Asymmetric wars of a different kind emerged after the end of the Vietnam conflict, pitting Western forces against insurgents in many parts of the world. I don't need to rehearse that story. The film followed the flag, first into Vietnam and then into those transnational or subnational uh, conflicts. There is uh, an extraordinary, I think, role to be played by the film The Deer Hunter, uh, because at the end of the film, a group of young working class men and women at the heart of the story wind up singing God bless America, but instead of it turning into the kind of, of uh, kitsch and flag waving that's happening in the American presidential campaigns, uh, something else happened because the people who sing it uh, have been through war. One is paraplegic, another is scarred mentally, and one of the circle who had totally lost his mind in Vietnam and committed suicide by Russian roulette had just been brought home and buried. The tone of the anthem is muted. Are they still patriotic? Probably. But the message can be read in another way, in a world of ugly choices. God had better bless America, for Americans cannot find answers in the old patriotic tags. War is madness, takes over completely in Apocalypse Now and in Full Metal Jacket, both tales of disillusionment and savagery. I need to refer as well in this third phase to Oliver Stone's Platoon of 1986 for a very simple reason. Stone was a director who drew on his own service in Vietnam. He was a soldier. His ambivalence about the war emerged in this treatment of two sergeants, one humane, the other a brute, who commits war crimes with impunity. Open the Pandora's box of war, Stone says, and who knows how any of us will be transformed by it. Atrocities are built into war. No one is unscarred by it. Here, Stone echoes many literary accounts of the passage in wartime from innocence to experience. The film is both reminiscent of World War I poetry that I talked about in my first lecture and Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried, published four years later in 1990. The link with the Holocaust is especially evident in the work of Steven Spielberg, and I do think he is a flawed but brilliant filmmaker. His masterpiece, Schindler's List, was followed five years later by Saving Private Ryan, which is not his masterpiece. The films both show the essential elements of the new cinema of war. The first is a powerful and realistic account of the morally ambiguous figure of Oskar Schindler, who lived on the tightrope of the Nazi bureaucracy surrounding the Holocaust and managed to save hundreds of Jews thereby. World War II is only the backdrop of the story, but there are few portrayals more powerful of precisely what Hitler's war against the Jews meant than the Aksion or murderous roundup in Krakow. In Saving Private Ryan, war is the central subject. Spielberg starts with blood and guts in a boldly realistic manner in his portrayal of the Normandy landings and then segues to a more conventional account of the rescue of a surviving soldier whose three brothers had died in combat. The film ends with a survivor asking his wife in the cemetery where one of the men who rescued him is buried if he is a good man. That is to say, if the loss of life of others in his rescue had produced something good to ennoble it. Spielberg is a cinematic uh, writer of redemption. Now, I think there, you know, I could go through the, war, the uh, uh, list of interesting films about the war in Iraq. Uh, there will be more about uh, Afghanistan and plenty on the Middle East. Uh, Spielberg uh, produced in 2005 the film Munich. Very interesting. Spielberg tells the story of the assassination squad that liquidated the men who masterminded the Munich massacre at the, 19, at the 1972 Olympics. After the killings had been invaded, avenged, the Israeli agent who is the hero and the central figure of the story resigns, tells his boss, I'm through with assassination because assassination changes nothing. What's extraordinary about it is that it makes my point about the lingering effects of silence. Why? Because he walks away from his boss in the Mossad and against, uh, walks away from his mi mission literally at a point where we see the two towers of the World Trade Center. The script says nothing about the juxtaposition of words and scenes. It doesn't have to. Spielberg knows occasionally that silence does it better. Now, in this very brief summary of film and war, I've had to omit so many masters. Eisenstein, I just mentioned, Vaida, Tarkovsky, Kurosawa. I could have chosen a whole range of filmmakers. And as in all three cases, I apologize to all those who would have written this lecture differently. Uh, I've also omitted the vexed question of filmmakers as ideologues. For example, uh, Gary Cooper's pacifist turned sniper in Howard Hawke's 1941 film, Sergeant uh, York. I'm not a Foucauldian. I don't believe the discourse determines what films have to say. I'd like to leave you with this. 
it's Samuel Fuller who I think said the most important thing about our current generation. He was the director of the Big Red One, 1980, and he was once asked what constituted a good war film. His answer was, and I quote, one which cultivates dignity and does not pursue voyeurism. He saw service in Africa, Sicily, Normandy, Belgium, and Czechoslovakia, and was present at the liberation of the Falkenau concentration camp. He was one of the few directors with very extensive combat experience. Dignity without voyeurism is indeed a good measure of the balance war films aim to achieve, and yet few succeed, I think in part because of the demands of spectacle, because of the demands of special effects, because of the attempt to produce what is not reproducible. Here is the central point about silence. It carries terror within it much more readily than the scariest movie score does. Stop the sound, and terror is one of the elements of the story that rushes to the surface. I did a, an eight-hour history of the First World War for the BBC and PBS, and I learned by uh, producing the film that if I wanted to make a statement that I thought was important, I turned the sound off and let the silence convey the meaning. Uh, and uh, I think in many respects that's uh, a lesson that most people who pay for films as producers believe they cannot afford to do. Well, in some cases I think they cannot afford not to do it. Indeed, we have so many other themes that I could have mentioned. Uh, Post-national warfare, uh, Terry George's Hotel Rwanda is a film about genocide. Uh, the friendship between two men at the heart of the 1984 film, The Killing Fields, about the genocide in Cambodia. These are themes that I think are very powerful. Surveying them, I think we can see the force of Fuller's plea for dignity. Films can portray men and women at war whose dignity, integrity, and existence are threatened disastrously, but who, if they are lucky, emerge from war as recognizable human beings nonetheless. We are left, therefore, with a modest conclusion War defies simple representation, but men at war can be presented with cliches or human qualities attached, depending on the actor, the director, the producer, God help us, and the audience the producers want to reach. In a vast array of non-documentary films, soldiers of many nationalities have been presented as frail, complex men, as well as cartoon strip ca figures of the Mel Gibson kind. What differs is the framing of the wars in which these soldiers fight. Therefore, I think we can see an evolution which I have presented in today's lecture. Film in the silent age stood back from realism. It could hint, suggest, gesture, but without sound, it could not portray war. In the World War II generation, a kind of spectacular realism took over with mixed effects. Phony wars were presented as real wars and given the moral clarity of the 1939-45 conflict, in most cases, that was enough. But from the 1970s on or thereabouts, soldiering was framed differently. It was darker, more tragic, more morally ambiguous, more focused on victims than on heroes. Heroic images of war were still on offer, but the colors of war grew somber, muted. Thus, the portrait of the soldier came to be more important than the portrait of the war in which he served. In countries with a volunteer army like this one or the United States, that is not a negative outcome. Uh, there is an extraordinary television ad for enlistment in the U.S. Army that's still going out on the television today uh, that the U.S. Army offers to make, not to make men strong, but to make them army strong, whatever that is. Yet once the broader public began to see war as morally precarious as it did beginning in the 1970s, I think and still does today, public support for the men who wage war became uncertain. Supporting the men but not the war is a very hard act to pull off. It usually winds up in disillusionment and disengagement. As the legacy of 100 years of war films, we ignore it at our peril. It is an important subject. The search for a balance between the spectacular and the indirect in visual portrayals of war goes on, tilted towards the spectacular by the immense popularity of computer war games. Indirection in that context is totally non-existent. But the film industry still has choices. It does not at all speak with one voice. To take but one very recent box office success, Steven Spielberg's War Horse continues his immensely popular set of cinematic meditations on war and its cruelties. Speaking of war through the story of an animal, 
and the young boy who searches for him, Spielberg tries to capture the futility of war in one of his many tales of the ways <clears throat> innocent children are betrayed by their elders. The spectacular elements of the film are impressive enough. The horse confronted by three tanks is filmmaking at a very high level indeed. The sheer sentimentality of the story, though, outweighs its moral message, much more powerfully conveyed indirectly in the stage version of a story which is still being performed today. A model of a horse designed brilliantly by a South African company to approximate the uneven cadence of the animal conveys the horror of war silently and in a way that puts the so-called real representation of Spielberg's film to shame. My first response, I don't know what others in the audience think, but my first response to seeing this film was to hope that someone would turn the sound off. Filming war, like configuring war and writing war, always works through mediation. Language mediates memory, and in particular, memories of war. The technical framework of cinema limited what could be done and at times distorted war beyond recognition. But that is true in elements of painting and sculpture and writing as well. I didn't present the equivalent of Mel Gibson in war poetry, but believe me, there's plenty of it. Time and again, exceptions appear, though, which make us reaffirm a belief with which I would like to close that the best defense we have against the ravages of war is the human imagination itself. It is on this point that I want to end this series of lectures and to thank all of you for accompanying me on this journey through the battlefields of the mind. Thank you very much.